Hello everyone, uh, my name is Paul Gregg, this is JF and David, and uh, we are going to present to you the Rossman Kaggle competition that we took on about two weeks ago, we started, so all the, weeks, all the work's been done in about a week and a half, two weeks. A little overview of what we'll be doing, <laughs> project scope, just a little bit of background about the actual competition itself, what's involved. Uh, what we did for EDA, feature engineering, using external data to add further features to get better insight on what is actually happening. Uh, an overview of a R package that we did most of our model building in called H2O and then the different models that we decided to go with. Stack generalization, results in future work, and then we'll open the board for uh, some questions. So, project scope. Rossman is a drugstore unique to Europe. They have about 3,000 stores across seven countries. Um, the whole idea of this was to predict six weeks of actual sales across 1,115 locations. The idea was to be able to allow managers to be able to uh, put their staff appropriately to increase the productivity and the motivation. I mean, you don't want just a few staff members on your most busiest day of the year because then you know that, uh, that hurts morale. And, that's not good for employment. The data itself is broken into a training and test set. The training set is about two and a half, three years worth of store uh, sales. It includes the dates, promotional periods, the sales themselves, the customers, state and school holidays, and a couple other features. The store data itself is a data set that describes the store that is uh, on a unique ID basis. It gives basic competition information about how close their competition is, how far, how long the competition is in business. Uh, store type and assortment, again, this is just categorical data. There's no exact uh, descriptions. It's just kind of 0, A, B, C. So to begin our EDA, we, uh, we went through a lot of the work that had previously been done to try and build on some of the great models that some of the participants had already built. One of the great things that we came across was a digraph built by Paul Shearer. This shows a moving average that you can put in, the amount of days that you want this average to be across, and it gives you an idea of what the sales actually looks like. One of the key points that we saw here is how some stores had these periods where there was just no sales. This was actually due to refurbishment periods, and uh, as JF will get into, we were able to build features that allowed us to get more uh, accurate models based off of this information. Other things that we found are in some of the stores, especially store 622, they had just missing data for whatever reason, bad reporting, whatever the main reason may be. Because of some of the deductions we're able to make based on when the stores were open, we're able to impute that these stores were open based on their sales and the customers and the other features that were involved. So, just for missing data, so for extended period of time? Yes. So yeah, this is the missing data over an extended period of time. It also showed us that there were spikes across some of these times. We would see that at a lot of times when the store would be closed for an extended length of time, that there would be a spike in sales, and then, exactly, like this right here, and then time off, and then a spike in sales. This kind of indicates maybe they had a promotion before, a promotion after, where they would have uh, heavy um, discounts to try and get customers through the doors, or whatever the reason may be. Slide. And JF will talk to you guys a little bit about the uh, feature engineering involved. Right. So um, what happens is uh, the data set that we had as, like uh, Paul described, around like 10, 12, 15 uh, columns. Uh, some of them are not very uh, all useful. Uh, for example, the competition data was mostly NAs than uh, anything else. So there's a lot of missing data. So basically, if you run a model just based on uh, the data that was provided by uh, by uh, Rossman, you would rank maybe, you would definitely be in the second half of the ranking. There is no, even with the best model on earth. So we had to uh, start uh, feature, uh, engineering features. So first, of course, uh, we play around with the features that are given to us, uh, that are included in the data. For example, we had the sales for two and a half years, so why not create an average of the sales for, for example, for every Mondays, we take the average of all the Mondays, and hopefully Mondays are look alike, which actually the case if you look on a Weekly seasonality, their Mondays tend to be good days, probably because people needed something on Sunday and they couldn't go because the store was closed, so they went on Monday. 
the same same ways goes for weekly and monthly uh, seasonality. So the, basically, there's a bunch of different seasonality in the in the cells, uh, lo very long term ones and uh, monthly ones, weekly ones. So we try to capture this by uh, uh, creating features such as the week of the year, day of the year, month of the year, etc. Uh, same way for uh, like Paul mentioned. Uh, there are some packs, uh, some correspond to before refurbishment. Uh, one week usually before the refurbishment, there's a big uh, spike. But there's also a spike when it's the first day of a week-long promotion. So you can, it's definitely uh, very noticeable. So, um, sorry. Then there's uh, some, I may have missed a slide, speed dates. Yes, okay, yeah. So um, also, yeah, of course, for the period of the year, we have uh, different uh, features that are helpful, like quarter and quarter beginning, month end, month beginning. There's another seasonality here at the beginning of the month. That's right after people get paid. There's uh, actually a noticeable, uh, uh, noticeably more sales at the beginning of the month rather than at the end of the month. Then we uh, try to gather more external data to really try to round this uh, data set up. So we added uh, Google Trends. And as we, uh, as we have uh, here, we have the different Google uh, trends of uh, Rossman, uh, DM, Drawberry in general, and uh, different benchmarks. And uh, you can see some kind of uh, correlation be between uh, the, actually the Google trend and the sales. So it's, it was pretty remarkable to find that a feature like that was actually uh, significant. significant. Um, we also, thanks to uh, looking at the, they, were provided, they provided us with the holidays and especially the school holidays. And what happens in Germany is that the school holidays are different for uh, all 16 different states in Germany. Some kids go, for example, the summer vacation, some kids go back to school as early as uh, mid-July, and others go back to school uh, as late as uh, beginning of September. So there's, the, you can actually identify the state in which the store is thanks to the school holidays. So uh, we were able to add the location, I mean the location of the store, the approximate location, at least the state in which they, they were. Uh, so thanks to that uh, feature that we added, we were able to gather uh, local data because actually weather is, uh, affects uh, sales. If it's a very heavy rainy day or if it's a snow day, you're not going to go to the store. You'll, if it's not an emergency, you'll just go the next day while you go the day if it's uh, really bad out, out there. Uh, there's also... Uh, uh, it can be, for example, extended periods of cold can lead to more people being sick and then needing more uh, drugs. So they, they might have, it uh, might affect their uh, sales too. So what we did, the same way that we did in the previous uh, feature, uh, we added uh, basically like the schedule of the weather uh, for each uh, store and each day. We put the previous 14 days of uh, weather, uh, including temperature, uh, events and things like that that we thought was relevant. And also a little uh, pseudo forecast the next two days of the weather as well. Uh, finally, we added the uh, global economic data. Actually, uh, uh, three of uh, or four of these features were also very uh, important. Uh, the best of these uh, indicators was actually the DAX, which is the German uh, equivalent of the uh, S&P 500, uh, the main index of the, of the country. That was actually very good correlated also with the sales. And uh, we also added a bunch of indicators like population growth, uh, G GDP growth, uh, leading indicators, business uh, health, and all this stuff, Me Me small and medium companies, etc. So we added a total of about 250 features. And then we uh, tried to use different models <coughs> to, uh, on uh, this new uh, data set. So, <coughs> and then what we did was we used a uh, package um, <coughs> called H2O, which is uh, open source machine learning um, platform. <coughs> and so there's essentially a R interface for H2O. And um, there's also R, there's also interfaces for uh, Python and uh, like a web enabled kind of notebook for H2O as well. And so, you know, just through the sort of use of H2O, I mean, you need to have uh, on a Mac, for instance, have a certain um, version of Java installed, you would start an H2O instance, and then, you know, what we did quite a bit of experiments where within R, rather than dumbifying a category, you can set it to a factor. And then we tried to experiment, like, setting some features to factors, and then some leaving just as uh, normal integers. And then we 
we did things like create validation sets uh, where we you could do infolds validation within uh, the call to H2O, but then you we could also create a separate validation set using stratified um, uh, creating a stratified data set. So in each store uh, would have to be in a particular fold, and then we would basically tune each model using manually or grid search, and then um, we just use the model to make predictions on the test set. And then we just iterate several times, and we're still doing it. Okay. And then just, <clears throat> and just briefly, I mean, these are some of the, we chose um, your algorithms. We started off with random forest where you're essentially averaging an ensemble of weekly predicting uh, trees. And then we would, uh, some of the tuning parameters that we looked at with the number of trees, the maximum depth of the uh, trees, and then the number of variables randomly sampled as candidates for, for splits. And so, uh, you know, one of the sort of reasons why random forest can be, uh, why we chose it, it's just very difficult to overfit, and then you can get variable importance as well. And then we also looked at gradient-boosted machines using H2O and some of the components that, some of the parameters that we, we chose to tune were the number of trees and maximum depth and the learning rate. And then we also are starting to look at H2O deep learning and we're just now starting to um, tune some of the parameters and try to set up a grid search to find the best parameters. But from my experience, and I haven't used it for about that long, it is kind of difficult to kind of tune the uh, deep learning within H2O. And then we are also starting to, I looked at a package, H2 Ensembles, that was written by somebody at Berkeley. And so essentially what this is, allows you to do is um, combine um, several different models like linear, uh, uh, JBM, deep learning, in a um, first step, and then you can bind the models in like a meta learner. And then we're also <coughs> looking at what's called stack generalization. So what you would do, we had a little bit of trouble kind of a, uh, initially sort of understanding what this did, was essentially you take the training set and split it into two parts, train A and train B, and then you create a model on train A based upon train B and vice versa. And then you create predictions. And then what you can do is essentially create a whole new feature. And then you, you can also, you take the predictions from the entire training set and then you create a prediction um, new feature for the test set. And then you can essentially run another model on, those, on the training set using the new feature. Okay, and results in future work. So what's the takeaway from all this? <clears throat> we have these awesome models, extremely accurate. We're first-time catalogers, and in a week and a half, we're able to get to the top 18%. And with our future work, in, with uh, what David said about the stack generalization <clears throat> and the ensemble, and we're also optimizing an XGBoost model that we'd like to build into the ensemble. What's the takeaway from all this? If your boss comes up to you and says, what's going on here? You have no idea. These are all black box, extremely accurate, extremely high predictive power models. And you can't say what's going on inside. So as a way of kind of playing with that accuracy interpretation trade-off, we decided to just build multiple linear regression, have each store have its own model with the basic elements of uh, our features and see how it would do. And with the way the Kaggle competition is, we are currently getting around 10% error rate with the multiple linear regression, we were around 20-25%. Still, on a good day, I mean, I would see that's pretty good. I think to a manager, you could actually give them an idea of where their sales are going. And if you look into those coefficients, you start to understand what's going on, you could actually gain some interpretation of what each, how each feature is affecting these sales. And that was really the takeaway for all, for all three of us, that there is a trade-off there with Kaggle, throw some really powerful models at it, throw it on AWS, let it run for days on end, get an awesome prediction, hopefully win the $30,000.
But in the real world, that's not exactly how it works. You need to have some type of idea of what's happening. You need to be able to present it. So I hope you guys enjoyed everything. Um, this was our first time at it. It's not going to be our last. And uh, we'll open the floor for any questions. What are the key features you find? Okay. The key features, uh, like I mentioned, some of uh, four of the indicators, economic indicators, were related. Uh, one was a leading uh, LCI, I think, leading something company indicator. And the DAX, DAX was a good one. Uh, of course, the sales, the daily average sales were like number one by far. And then the promo uh, first date. Promo first date was a very strong one as well. Promotion. Yeah, promotion. Yes, promotion. Uh, first day of uh, promotion. Uh, what happens in the Rossman when they uh, start a promotion? It always is exactly last exactly a week. So when they start a week of promotion, the first day is like uh, is uh, definitely uh, relevant. Yes. It's kind of a two-part question. Are you running H two O on a cluster on your local machines? We're running it on our local machines. We. We were running it on an AWS, but we had difficulty parallelizing it on AWS. Okay. Yeah. So that was that was a challenge. I mean, the models. I mean, random forest. I mean, you can. So we're essentially you've got a mil, we've got a million rows, and so you can imagine with you know a couple of dozen features. I mean, you're talking several hundred. million. Yeah. yeah. A couple hundred. Yeah. So you're talking like a pretty large data set. So it's taking a couple of hours to run a one just random forest model. So, finding it generally stable or not? Uh, you know, it can be a little unstable. I think there's some tricks you can do, like you can set, like when you first initialize H2O, I think there's some parameter you can set, like aggregate equals yeah. to false, which tends to make it a little uh, more stable. Yeah. yeah. So, but, um, to, to add to that, actually, what was very stable is uh, GBM. The GB, H2O GBM is like, I, I, I haven't broke, we haven't broken it once. But, but, I, but the random forest, I would, we would, I mean, I would break it like every other time. Uh, I mean, for, I know what you mean. Work better if we didn't know. Sometimes it so. can be unstable, like you need to make sure that you shut H2O down when you reset the parameters. Yeah. But. That's true. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yeah. Yes? When you use the DAX, what time granularity did you use? Da daily, daily. Like something realistic, something that they could have actually access to, you know, it's the open. Every day is the open. And did you, did you try different um, daily, weekly? Um, no, we didn't put too much work because, uh, as I mentioned, we added 250 features and see what stuck. So we didn't try to shift it around, but uh, that's, that's of course, uh, something that could be done. Because we've done that for other features like the weather and the schedule, so it would have added. Too broad. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you were we were doing some iterative feature selection as well. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah, that, that's mentioned. So that's a very good point. Uh, we came up with a new way to save features is we, uh, instead of using all the the usual uh, ways to select features, we came up with, the, with this new way here is we would run a, a small GBM with uh, like 50 trees to get an idea of the ranking of the features. And uh, at this point, it would be already very obvious which ones are the top 50 features. Are have way more importance. Explain the ninety nine percent of the variance. So that was I thought that was a pretty cool way to select features. Uh, run a little uh, uh, fifty trees takes twenty minutes, and then you know exactly which features you have your ranking of features. And yeah, that's very uh, useful. Were, the, were there results in, in currency, like dollars per inventory saved or extra sales or anything like that, or yeah. euros in this case? The, the, or was it all just accuracy or prediction of demand? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a uh, accuracy of prediction of the sales, the the revenue of the store, of the what's in the left in the cashier <laughs> at the end of the day. Yes. Do you have like access to like the GDP of the country? Or the yeah. That's precisely what I added among the. But unfortunately, GDP is not something that is evaluated every day. It's a data point that you get access to maybe once every quarter, so it's not. Unfortunately, all the all the indicators that were yearly or quarterly were basically not very useful because they don't vary fast enough to capture the main, I mean, the, the, the local trends of the data set. So unfortunately, that was not very useful. But the ones that changed like monthly and uh, daily, like the DAX, that was actually, they ranked pretty high. Yes? 